we can live on this earth really to be to be well pleasing to to God and to Jesus. And how that we could begin to build a, a treasure house or a, a a store of treasure in heaven in what we do down here. See, Jesus said, he said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon the earth Amen. where moth can corrupt, where thieves can break through and steal. Yes. See, anytime I had my car broken into, I come out, my window's broke, and my car stereo missing, that scripture will come to me. I'll say, okay, Lord, you said it. thieves can break through and steal. <laughs> I won't be too upset. See, but Jesus don't want us to treasure things on this earth like that. Oh, there she goes. All right. Seppi's going to be all right. Amen. Amen. Everyone say, be blessed, Seppi. Be blessed, Seppi. Amen. Now, Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. He said, but lay yourselves up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He meant heaven. He meant uh, treasures in heaven. Now, the treasures in heaven are much different than what you would think of the treasures on earth. Amen. Now, though heaven has massive amounts of gold and diamonds and, and precious stones and jewels, the, the treasure is not in those stones or the gold or the diamonds, but the treasure is in the glory of God that's producing manifestations of his glory which causes his whole city to be made out of pure gold and you may receive a crown in heaven that has jewels and diamonds but those jewels and diamonds is, uh, will each stand for something that you've done in the earth for the glory of God so those things that, that we do on earth, you see, we were looking Friday at that scripture which, which said some men will build with gold, silver, or precious stones, and some with wood, hay, and stubble. He said, and that day shall declare every man's work of what sort it is. He said, and if any man uh, suffer loss because the fire... In a, this is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, between verses like 6 and 10. It says, that they shall declare, for every man's work shall be tried by fire. Amen. And if any man's work is burned, the Bible says, he shall be saved, but he'll Amen. suffer loss. Amen. But the ones whose work shall remain, they shall receive a reward. So whatever you do on earth... That will cause you to receive a reward in heaven. You know, you can't live for your just for yourself. Now, you know, you can be saved and, and, and still live quite a selfish life, you know, for example. You know, you can get born again and you can still live for yourself for the most part, but you're trusting in Jesus, you know. Well, when you get to heaven. You may not have much rewards given to you like you're going to see all the other saints, you know, the ones that, that get rewards coming. And, and this is what the Bible's talking about. Now, we're going to look deep into this today. And he says, we are confident, I say, this is verse 8, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul was saying that we're willing, which means we we think good thoughts about being absent from the body. Now, he, he's talking about when your spirit and soul, that's who you really are, you leave your fleshly body when, when someone dies, and then to be present with the Lord. Now, 
I know some people want to think about that. They're like, well, wait a minute. I don't know if I'm ready for all that now. <laughs> See, but this is what we're talking about, where we can live in a way where at any moment Amen. where you're willing, you're, you're thinking about it like, Lord, it would be so good to be in your city right now. It would be so good to be dwelling in paradise right now. Yes. Willing rather to be absent from the body. So you've got no fear when you're serving the Lord. The Bible says that through death, Jesus destroyed him who has the fear of death. That is the devil. Amen. And he delivered those that were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We're not subject to that bondage. We don't fear death. We walk with Jesus in a way where we're constantly desiring to even be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen. So he says, wherefore we labor. Wherefore we labor. I got one Bible if anyone, if, if there's someone that wants to borrow a Bible. Okay, here we go. Pass that Bible back there. I'll, I'll uh, work on getting this thing fixed uh, by, next, by this Friday. I thought I had it going. It was working. But then, I don't know, it must be the cord shortened in and out. But nevertheless, he says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Wherefore we labor, So, in Christ, when you're a Christian, we're talking about the labor you do, the works you do. It's not just, see, we're learning that it's not just a one-time confession. Say, Lord, I believe that you're my Savior. You died for my sins. Amen. Now, let me go about my way and do my own business. <laughs> you may end up in heaven that way. But, how many of you want to build a life that's pleasing to the Lord? Amen. And this is what he's talking about. Wherefore we labor. See, when Jesus appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos, and he began to speak to the people, uh, speak to John, he said, I want you to write seven churches a letter. Every time he would start off saying, and unto the church of Ephesus, and so forth, he said, right, I know your works. And your labor. I'm seeing more and more from Jesus that after he saves you, after you're born again, that what is that process where the Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. He said, but it is not of yourselves. In fact, let me... Let me pull it up so I can quote it right. It's in Ephesians 2 and verse, and verse 8. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. You're saved. Through faith, you receive salvation from it, from your uh, sins. You pass from death to life. You receive eternal life. Then he says, not of works. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. But then he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Amen. How many of you see that right there? Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we were created in Christ unto good works. <clears throat> so being saved, being a Christian, doesn't mean you're against doing good works. Amen? Amen. <laughs> it means that when the grace of God comes upon you, he saves you, you can do even more good works for his name. And this is what we're talking about, how he actually rewards us for these works then. You're not saved by the good works, but you're rewarded for them. Let's go back to uh, 2 Corinthians. 
five, and eight. He says, well, look at verse nine. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we, meet, we may be accepted of him. Now, it's not contradictory because, see, the Bible says that but through faith, through the blood of Jesus, through the name of Jesus, he has made us accepted in the beloved. We are accepted into the kingdom. But this word accepted means well-pleasing or fully agreeable. So he says that we labor whether present or absent, whether present or absent, we may be well pleasing to him, fully agreeable. See, there's a difference between being allowed in somewhere and then fitting in there. See, you could, you could take a third grader and let him come into an eighth grade class, for example. You could let him in by grace and say, come on in. <laughs> but let him try to sit down and let that third grader try to do eighth grade work. That third grader's not going to be fully agreeable with what's going on. So how do we, how do we become accepted of him? He says, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Or we may become fully agreeable with Jesus. And then look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It's a judgment seat. Now, this judgment seat of Christ is not to determine whether or not you are saved or not. The judgment seat of Christ for the believer is to see how fully agreeable you've been with Jesus while, you're, while you were in the body. You're going to find out if you don't know already before you go. See, see most of us know anyway, you know. Most of us have a pretty good idea how we're doing between us and Jesus. Amen? Amen. We know whether or not we've been meeting with him and we know whether or not we've been running from his voice Amen. or just putting him off. You know, Jesus is calling and you keep saying, yeah, I know, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to get there. You know, don't worry. I'm going to get with you. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is different than that judgment that we read in the book of Revelation that says, and I saw all the dead stand before God. He said, I saw a great white throne. This is in like Revelation chapter 20. And he said, and I saw all the dead stand before God, great and small. And I saw death and hell gave up the dead. That's when the people that are in hell right now the people that are in death, they're gonna be they're gonna be given up out of hell to stand before God one time. Even though the judgment has already been set for them, they're gonna they're gonna have their moment before God. But this here is a different judgment. This judgment seat of Christ, in fact, you could start judging yourself right now. Before you get to that judgment seat. Yes, so when you appear before Christ, when you leave the body, and then he's going to let you know how well you've done and how many rewards you got. It's all going to be a good old time. He's going to say, you know, I want to I wanna commend you on this and that. You got many rewards. You're going to find in your mansion different rooms and different blessings that are prepared for all that you've labored upon the earth. You want it to go well, amen? <laughs> but we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 
Even as a believer, see, Paul wrote this to the, to the church. He said, for we all must appear. We all will be made manifest or rendered apparent before the judgment seat of Christ. We labor, whether we're present with him or absent, that we may be well-pleasing to him. That's what verse 9 says. We're, we're, we're striving. Labor means we, we're eager to strive. We're studying. We're being earnest to find ourselves well-pleasing to the Lord, dying to ourselves, letting Jesus live in us, <laughs> choosing to walk in love, choosing to walk in forgiveness and grace. Amen. Choosing not to hold anything in your heart against somebody. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Forgiving everybody. Yes. Like that song says, forgiveness is something that you always give away to someone that don't deserve it. <laughs> yes, Lord. But we must all forgive. See, and you don't want to stand before that judgment seat and you got aughts in your heart against people. Now that's one of the things that you got to be careful that you don't even get let in the heavenly city because Jesus said if you don't forgive everyone from your heart he said neither will my heavenly father forgive you. So he said we must all appear before that judgment seat. Now, now look what he says. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done. Whether it be good or bad. This is the reward system the Lord has. It's not the salvation system. We just read we're saved by grace through faith. And like uh, I quoted a minute ago, that if people are building their lives with wood, hay, and stubble, the fire will burn all their works up, but yet they shall be saved. How many of you see that, that Jesus is going to give every man, it says, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done. Not according to what he believes, but according to what he hath done. Whether it be good or bad. So, Christians that do bad things, in other words, now he's not talking about Christians going out doing murder sprees and... Uh, <laughs> having adulterous affairs every weekend. But we're talking about people that have been born again, been saved. And then at the judgment seat of Christ, they're going to receive the things done in their body. What you do in your body is very important. The time that you have in this earth is very important. It means a lot, saints. God judges people for what they do in this little time we have down here in the body. And the, the effects of what you do here will carry on through eternity, whether good or bad. Now, unfortunately, people that reject Jesus, they have no hope of, of eternal life in heaven. But they will remain forever in the under the powers of darkness, in torments and in, in, in darkness and in fire and flames. So let's go back and look at what he says here. That in verse 9, 
Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Let's look to Jesus right now for a minute and say, Lord Jesus, I want to be well pleasing to you. Fully agreeable to you. There's none other like you. You are my hope and my salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Now, be, becoming fully pleasing to him means that you, you begin to not be conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Becoming conformed to the image of Jesus, where you, you start becoming more and more like him. Your words begin to change. Where once before, you may have not hesitated to use all types of words that would glorify the devil. It could be cussing words, negative words, gossiping words, hurtful words. See, but becoming fully agreeable with Jesus means that all of his ways begin to get worked out in your life. All the ways of Jesus, even in your words that you speak. See, Jesus knows that, that some, some of us may, in times past, been, would be quick to shoot off our mouth at someone. Someone says something to you and you're going to hit him right back. <laughs> Amen. But the more you become fully agreeable with Jesus, how do you do that? You do that by meditating on his word. Amen. Amen. Getting that Bible. Whether you got a old-fashioned Bible, which is in the form of a book, <laughs> or whether you got one of the many digital Bibles that you can look up on your computer, laptop, phone. I like them all, but lately... I just use the Bible on my phone, amen. It's an awesome Bible. <laughs> but the more you look at those words in that Bible, what, what Jesus said, and you begin to be conformed, you, you meditate on his words, so you begin to get transformed into his image. Where you become more and more like him. Your words begin to change where what what used to be where people can bet, you're going to cuss them out. But after encountering Jesus, after letting Jesus in, you return a soft answer or an answer of wisdom. Or sometimes don't even give no answer. <laughs> Depending on the situation. Where the wisdom of God is working through you, where you're, you're acting more like Jesus. These are the things that, see, when, when, you, when you appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Amen. you're going to be, you're going to be um, judged up against who Jesus is. That's going to be the standard of how you're going to be rewarded. Now, his blood already saved you, washed you, cleansed you. You don't got nothing to worry about that if you believe in Jesus. You've repented from your sins. But in this life, we're, we want to build a life up to become more like Jesus. When you appear before him, see now what does the Bible say? That when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And, and, and when you're appearing before the judgment seat, now notice it says the judgment seat of Christ. 
Because when he's looking at you and you're looking at him, it's his perfection that's gonna that that you're gonna have to measure up with. Now, saints, I saw this happen. <laughs> Back in 2008, I know I shared this a few times, but when I was praying one day before church, it was a Thursday night when we had church on a Thursday, and I was praying, and suddenly I found myself standing before the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And what burned into me, as I'm looking at his face, and then afterwards, I kept saying, Love and perfection. Love and perfection. I was trying to grasp what I experienced, you know. But what what I understand and what I understood even in those moments when I was, when he was right there in front of me, looking at me, it was like I was standing before the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> Because I could tell he was seeing everything in my life. But all glory goes to God that when he was looking at me, he had a, he had a wonderful smile on his face. <laughs> but I could tell at the same time, he, was, he, he could see me completely. His smile, though, basically reached out and just hugged me even though he didn't he didn't come close enough to touch me but I was standing very close about about this close to him and that's when all of a sudden his face turned into a lion I cannot believe that as I'm looking at Jesus I'm, his eyes turned green then his whole face transformed I'm talking about the transformers <laughs> Jesus transformed into a real lion right in front of my face I mean, this was a real lion. <laughs> I said, the lion of Judah. But, but the point is that I saw, and then he, he turned back into himself. What he let me see, though, he let me see perfection. And I noticed, and I got a revelation that my life, as well as all the life of all the saints, of all people, have been called to be what he is. I mean, perfection. I saw him as the son of God and the son of man, which he is. And Ever since that moment, it's been a something begin to work in me. And I know God, God has done this because of the ministry. For one, you know, for one thing, to share with other people. But my eyes were open to many things in the Scripture after seeing Him concerning His perfection and His perfect love. Because when I saw Him, He looked like love. I could describe his hair, his eyes. He had a mustache, beard, all that stuff. Jesus. <laughs> Even to his hair on his left side, kind of twisted a little bit as it was hanging down. <laughs> there was a few twists in it, just a couple. I mean, I saw him that clear. But what I, what I, I couldn't even describe how he looked when I first saw him because all I, all that was coming out of my spirit is that he looks like love. His love just really, you know, you talk about being comforted of God. Comforted by God. But his perfection is something I saw that what he was, I knew he was my destiny. And he's your destiny. See, but we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When you get to know Jesus, when you come into a deeper relationship with him, you will become more and more like him. Let's look at what the word says about this. Look at Luke 6, 
Luke 6 and 40. And Jesus said something very interesting here. Luke 6 and 40, Jesus said, the disciple is not above his master. In other words, we're not above him. He said, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. How many of you can say, I never knew that was in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus said the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect, someone say perfect, perfect. shall be as his master. Now this word perfect means to complete thoroughly. That means there is a process of work that's being done in, on your mind, in your soul, deep in your heart. Many people, he's healing deep wounds in your soul. See, because he's got to heal you. One of, the, one, one of the words for perfect means to repair and to adjust. Yes, Lord. Yes. If you've been wounded in your soul and you got hurt, you can tend to not respond normally to other people. It can make you afraid of getting into relationships for example, cause you to lash out at other people. God's got to heal all that so that you can become more like Jesus. See, Jesus responds to everyone in a perfect way. Everyone. Jesus Christ heals and delivers those that are oppressed. He's up to heal the brokenhearted. But when a religious hypocrite confronts him, he knows how to tell them they're nothing but a snake and a viper and they better repent. <laughs> he, he responds to everyone perfect. Glory to God. Oh, you got to just read the words in red sometimes. You can get addicted to Jesus by getting a Bible that has all his words in red and just read all his red letters for a good couple weeks. You'll see how amazing the Son of God is, how brilliant in wisdom, greater than the wisdom of Solomon, much greater, because Jesus Christ is Lord over Solomon, amen. And... He's got to adjust and repair everything in you. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. If you've been a rebellious child, not honoring your mother or your father, you don't like any authority, you curse the police, the mayor, and the president. <laughs> Don't care what nobody says, you're going to do your own thing. And that's what a lot of the music is promoting into the heads of these little children. But then when that person comes to Jesus, they got to humble themselves under God's mighty hand and begin to pray for the mayor, begin to pray for the president, amen? amen. And repent to their mother and father. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And they'll be restored. See, and that's part of that completing that repairing. Whatever is out of sync with Jesus has to be repaired and be completed and be adjusted. Rebelliousness. Now not to mention if you're out there getting drunk and high and any sins in your life, Jesus breaks those chains. Amen? What does the song say? There's power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. Every chain. Every chain. Huh. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So 
all that is adjusted, all that is repaired, it's fixed. And it don't matter how deep a person gets into sin or rebellion. See, the Bible says when they rebel so much against the word of God, he'll bring them down. Yes. They'll yes. find themselves in chains of iron, Ooh. locked behind bars. Yes. Yes. But then when they call unto the Lord, the Bible says he'll answer them and he'll deliver them. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> oh, by the time they get out of that cell, they'll be talking like Jesus. All right. <laughs> All right. Walking like Jesus. Someone say Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. So he says, he says, everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. That means the Christians that follow Jesus, that he that you allow his work to be worked in you. You allow him to complete his perfect work in you. You shall become like Jesus, he's saying. That word per, per, um, everyone that is perfect means everyone that is adjusted, everyone that is fit in and repaired to complete thoroughly. You ought to want Jesus to let his complete work be done in you. Like that one song says, just let go and let God. Amen. Amen. Now, it's on so many levels. Some people are just walking on the sand of the things of God and just looking out at the waters. Some people are just at the shoreline, just letting the toes just begin to feel how it feels in the waters of the Spirit of God. Some people moved up, moved that up into the knees. Like, wow, this is feeling really good. Glory to God. Some people are just deep. Then you got other people just just take a run and a dive and they dive all in and they're under that water just swimming. Lord. <laughs> Amen. There's so many levels, but the love of God covers all. Amen. And that's why He saves you by His grace. His grace will cover you till you get in them deep waters. Amen. Amen. His, His ways are so amazing. His grace got you covered. As you're on your journey towards being perfected. Now look at what uh, 1 John says. Chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, and hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. Now he's not talking about all the Old Testament commandments. He's talking about Jesus' commandments. To love one another. He that says I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now, the Lord showed me This knowing him is coming into a deeper knowledge of him. Now, you can be saved by him without really knowing him that well. That's why you can be saved and still not walking in his commandments, still not loving one another, but his grace has covered you. The truth has just not been established in that person's heart because they don't know Jesus that well. He's saying, he that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Jesus. That word know, when he says, I know him, means, oh, wait a minute. He's talking about those that are aware of him. Those that can feel him have a seat, grandson. Those that are sure of him. He that said, I know him, or I, I'm sure of him. In other words, you can't really say you know him that surely 
unless you're keeping his word. And the truth will be established in you. And then verse 5 says, But whoso keepeth his word, in him is the love of God perfected. Someone say perfected. perfected. The love of God is consummated. That word perfected means to consummate in character. You experience his amazing love in everything. It means his love has completed you. And hereby we know that we are in him. See, it's when that love is perfected. When you, when you really come to know him, See, and how does this work? When, you, when you're keeping his words, when you're meditating in his word, how do you get his word? Well, you get his word, one thing, by reading that Bible. You get his word when you come to church. You get it, you know, his word is coming in so many ways. You got all types of TV channels preaching his gospel. You can get his word on the radio. It's important to meditate in his word. Now, it's also important to fellowship together in the household of God. God can do things for you when you when you assemble together, like the Bible says, don't forsake assembling together. That's what we're doing now. His word is being revealed to us right now. And then as you take his word seriously day by day, you pick up that Bible daily. Jesus said, pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And at one point he said, give us today our daily bread. See, Jesus said in another space, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So you need that intake of the word. He says, whoso keepeth his word. You take his word seriously. You take his word before anyone else. I don't care if your daddy don't, don't, don't agree with the words of Jesus. You, cho you choose Jesus' words above your daddy's word. You know? Amen. I'm talking about your earthly daddy. Amen. If your grandpa, maybe your grandpa is like a big chief over your whole tribe. <laughs> and he got a big stick and a big mouth. <laughs> I don't care what he's hollering out. If it's contrary to the ways of Jesus... You have a right to choose Jesus. Amen. 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 <laughs> and Jesus may use you to make that, that big grandpa repent. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You keep his word above anyone else. Right. You pray that your husband and wife are walking in the word of God. Mm -hmm. But if one of them don't obey the word of Jesus, you're holding on to Jesus' words no matter what. Your relationship with Jesus is more important than your relationship with your husband and wife. Amen, Moshe? <laughs> Our relationship with Jesus is number one. <laughs> that is whosoever keepeth his word. See, when you love his word that much, see, but when you love his word, all you're going to do is love your enemies anyway. <laughs> If that grandpa, that dad, or that husband or wife is acting bad, you're just going to ooze the love of Jesus to them anyway. <laughs> they can yell at you. They can harp on you. They can try to get you not to go to church and try to blaspheme God's name. And you can just walk in the love of God and answer them with the, with the love of Christ. You can tell them, well, I'm sorry if you don't know the benefits of serving Jesus, but I found Jesus. I'm going to the house of God, and if you're here when I get back, I'll see you then. God bless you. <laughs> I remember Benny Hinn uh, hearing his testimony. He said he, he was born in Israel, and he became a Christian. His dad was not a Christian. His dad forbade him to go to church. He said he had to climb out his bedroom window.